Good morning from the internet. I'm Brett, this is Lee, and we're here live at O'Reilly Velocity in London. You can actually see London in the background even though that's not really the background. <laughs> we are green screening it today in a conference room. Uh, London today is actually pretty uh, foggy and classically uh, slightly rainy, so uh, that was a shot I took earlier this week, so I uh, thought I would give you a view, a fake nice view of where we really are. Um, so we've been here all week actually talking Docker, Kubernetes, containers, service mesh, uh, networking. Serverless, uh, observability, distributed systems. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of hashtags that go along with Velocity. Yeah, cloud native, hashtag cloud native, hashtag CNCF probably at some point. Um, Velocity, in case you're not aware, Velocity is a conference uh, focused around distributed systems, cloud native technologies, um, Obviously, data centers are still involved with that, but I think they, they really try to focus on the distributed systems, which is most systems today, right? Most systems being built today are distributed. It's pretty rare to see a single monolithic app that's only on one machine. <laughs> lots of, yeah, lots of microservices uh, being, being tossed around. Lots of, uh, lots of uh, training um, going on in and around microservices. As a matter of fact, um, I think you had some training. I did have some here. training, and you had some training. We actually both were doing training at the same time here. We had workshops. Uh, this week, I did one on Docker and Swarm and... Uh, service Mesh for me, so a bit on Istio, specifically. Yes. Yeah, and that's uh, a, is that a CNCF project? You know, um, not yet. Okay. Uh, there's been uh, discussions around oh, that, okay. but, but uh, that particular project, uh, there are there is a Service Mesh inside of the CNCF, and it's okay. uh, uh, Linkerd. Okay. Um, Istio itself is, uh, as a project, isn't... Uh, ready yet? Okay. From, from their pers from their perspective, from have, their they, have they been getting briefings? I know that's a thing too. I didn't know. If uh, yeah, there's been uh, been a presentation of Istio in one of the CNCF working groups, the okay. networking working group, which is uh, probably a, an appropriate venue for right. uh, kind of a service mesh discussion. Um, uh, I think you know the two organizations that are by and large stewarding Istio, um, Google and IBM, and there yeah. are lots of contributors outside of that, but. Um, but I think it mostly is from their perspective that the, the project itself had only uh, 1.0 um, just here recently. And, oh, cool. Um, and so I think it's, it's a, an open discussion there as to whether or not right. Istio would... Does it go there? Does it belong there? Does it, yeah, does yeah. it need it? Um, so in case you didn't know, we just jumped into a whole lot of stuff. If you're not savvy on service mess, service discovery, uh, which is a sort of a, a relatively new problem now that we're able to dynamically deploy workloads so quickly and so often in containers, um, that problem wasn't as big a problem for most organizations before they had containers because they weren't so agile. Um, is that accurate? Yeah, I think that that's, that's absolutely accurate. Yeah. As a matter of fact, um, that's kind of the way in which... Um, in the uh, short book that I'd recently um, authored through O'Reilly, it was, uh, the way that I described it was, you, Service Mesh is one of those tools that you, that really the value that you derive for it, from it is really only after you've gotten to a certain level of scale. Uh, you've yeah, done, complexity, yeah. You've kind of done your, you know, your individual host, you've gone to um, a, a container orchestrator, and then after that you start to understand that, um, it's not the container orchestrator isn't providing you maybe everything that you need. Right. An additional layer there might help. Um, so a bit of uniform observability, a bit of granular traffic control, uh, maybe some um, security in the middle of your microservices, maybe between them. Yeah. And so that's not just a soft, gooey center uh, inside. <laughs> and so, uh, but but you know, just as people have you know come to as you've instructed on Swarm and, and Kubernetes. Um, and if people have, uh, and that's, you know, those orchestrators have begun to mainstream. I yeah. Think may, maybe a next logical step there that people might find is is potentially the need for a service mesh. Cool, um, cool. And I'm sure we're going to have questions on that today, and if not, we'll, we'll keep talking about service mesh. Um, so to jump back real quick, in case you're new to this uh, YouTube Live, I do this every week, uh, not always with great guests like Lee, but we... Um, we talk about Docker and Swarm and Kubernetes and container tools and everything basically server, distributed computing, um, and you get to ask questions. So if you're getting your questions into the chat now, we will answer those uh, throughout the hour that we're here. We get to uh, answer as many as we can and hopefully have good answers, <laughs> uh, answers that you like at least. And um, before that, I just want to catch you up on some things that are going on. So. 
I mentioned last week that uh, Hacktoberfest was going on, so that's now officially over. Hopefully you got your five pull requests in on GitHub because DigitalOcean and GitHub were giving away t-shirts to anyone who get, did five open source pull requests. Thank you to any of you that actually did some pull requests on some of my repos, and of course, thanks for any of you that worked in open source. I actually got a few pull requests that people had never, they'd been using open source forever and had never contributed back to open source. Oh, so they, they submitted pull requests and they were learning the process of you know, what's the appropriate stuff to put into a pull request on GitHub. Like mm. maybe don't do multiple things in one big pull request. And that's, we all learned that, we all did that uh, at first, not knowing what to do. And I'm sure my first one was probably like a one word change because I was too scared to do anything else. <laughs> I had maybe more back and forth on my first pull request yeah. than I would admit to. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. and uh, I, think my, actually, I think my first Docker pull requests were on documentation. And I always joke that, uh, my my first the first reply was that I wasn't putting a comma in the correct place for their documentation because they use Oxford commas, uh -huh. and I loved that feedback because it just meant that like they've got it locked down. They they know exactly what they want in their documentation. They've got people reviewing it, and it was quality stuff. So uh, they, they weren't just to let anybody, even a Docker captain, just put oh, <laughs> updated yeah, sure. documentation. So um, so thanks for that. So October October Fest is over. It will be again next year. Uh, again, sponsored by Twilio, uh, DigitalOcean, and uh, GitHub, which I'm a fan of all three, so I always like to talk about that. Uh, other news we have is Docker is about to release 18.09, their first official stable release of the new release schedule, which is a six-month life cycle, which means we get uh, less major updates, but they get supported for longer with patches, which is a good thing if you're not trying to constantly replace your servers all the time. So. That will be out here hopefully this month, um, and with that, may become Docker may update uh, Enterprise Edition with some new stuff. We'll see, um, and then of course when that happens, I will show off some stuff. My biggest two exciting features that I demoed last week were Build Kit, um, which is a really neat new way to build images much faster, uh, much more efficient, and it has lots of advantages for extensions and expanding the way that you can build things and extra features you can throw in on your own. And then the other feature that I keep talking about is if you're anything involved with ops. If you're uh, ever having to manage Docker servers remotely, there's a new way that I will be soon putting out a YouTube video on, on just how easy it is to use the Docker command line on your machine and use SSH as a tunnel to talk to the Docker engine on the remote server. So you no longer need to open up the TCP port and put TLS certificates on your Docker engine to now control it from a remote machine, which is huge because that was always a pain, right? Especially in open source. So I demoed that last week in my call, and in, uh, in my my call, like this is a phone huh. call. <laughs> I'm seems, old. <laughs> seems like there'd be some Ansible fans out there with uh, yeah, that right? remote SSH. Uh, yeah, I mean, all, that, all you're doing is setting an environment variable, and then Docker's cl client will automatically just tunnel through the SSH connection. So um, An Ansible probably has just an easy way to do it already, but this might allow you to do it without Ansible needing to tunnel it through SSH mm -hmm. and do that, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was always a way for people to figure out, they could always hack together their own SSL or SSH tunnel if they were savvy, but for those of us that aren't super savvy on all that stuff, this is like basically the easiest way possible I could imagine. In fact, when I saw the feature come out, I was like, this is, the soup, this is a bonus ops feature that no one ever talked about, and uh, I think it should be on the top of the list because it's a, it's a pretty big deal, uh, I think, for internet security because we've had some reports come out this year that people are putting uh, in Docker and Kubernetes on the internet without without being locked down properly, yeah. yeah. Some open dashboards. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, some open engines probably. I'm imagining that now the hackers are scanning for the Docker ports to see if they can just control servers mm -hmm. remotely. Because, uh, you cool. know, if you, get, if you can get Docker, then you can basically get root. Yeah, <laughs> so. you know, who wouldn't want their own uh, cluster to run workloads on right. if you can... It's all about Bitcoin, so they, <laughs> they all want to mine their Bitcoin. So don't leave your servers open on the internet, and check out 1809 uh, for a new SSH feature. Uh, and I'll be putting up a YouTube video. I actually recorded it, and we're going to be editing it soon. So, um, All right, so what else? Uh, in Velocity this week, we just had the keynote today. And you and, got to uh, sit in there, so. Yeah, there were um, pleasantly four female keynoters. Nice. Uh, all right in a row, which was nice. uh, all high quality. Um, particularly enjoyed um, uh, Crystal of Condé Nast had uh, elegantly, I think, almost in the same breath, put um, ITIL, disaster recovery planning, 
uh, chaos engineering and like microservices sort of all in the same. She sort of <laughs> spanned the scope of about two decades kind of all wow. in one, which is, which is great. Um, yeah, no, but the, kind of back, back to the hashtags that we were talking about later about what uh, Velocity is all about, uh, distributed systems, ob observability, monitoring, um, just, you know, ops, uh, microservices. Um, I was looking at the schedule earlier this morning when I woke up, uh, was uh, super excited about um, a particular set of topics that I saw in a row. And then pretty disappointed to understand that, oh, those are all at the same time. Uh. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I've got lots of recordings to come back and, and catch up on. So. And that's always a tough part of, of conferences. And I always go home thinking, I'm going to watch all of them, and then I don't watch them all. And I, I think that's one of the values of a conference is it forces you. <laughs> you have to go. If you're not talking to someone in the hallway, which is also, like, my favorite thing to do at, yeah. at a conference, uh, you, it, you, it forces you to at least – Stop checking Twitter for a little bit. Stop reading email and, and pay attention to someone because that can be hard. There's some internal, well, for most of it, guilt in there. If you if you paid for a conference ticket, that you've got to get some, derive some value right. out of it. So you've got to you got to go home with the, some notes. Yeah, <laughs> some notes. Um, well, cool. So we're gonna get to the questions in a second. Uh, I want to quickly. We're gonna actually switch the screen so we can uh, maybe show off some things. We won't. Uh, let's see if this actually works. And we're back. <laughs> so um, I wanted to just mention real quick, in case you're uh, new to my courses, I actually teach a couple of courses on the internet as well as in real life. And you can, you can find all those at brettfisher.com slash docker. I'll actually throw that in the chat. Uh, those are coupons to all my courses, so you can get a deal on that, as well as a bunch of other resources, including information about this YouTube channel. If you like this AMA, if you're interested at all in uh, container technologies and cloud native stuff, uh, DevOps in general, then make sure you uh, like and subscribe and then click that little bell and it'll notify you every time we go live. And that way you'll, uh, you'll be able to see more of these. We're now storing these AMAs every week so you can see in a playlist on my channel all the old Ask Me Anythings, which is maybe some way to kill your time and go to sleep at night like maybe just play it as a as, as a way to fall asleep because me talking about docker every week uh, over and over again um might put us all to sleep but now we have you so. well but you've been talking about docker for well uh about as far back as docker goes i suspect um as a matter of fact i guess i'm kind of curious of the so you just got done giving some training two days of training yeah. i think uh, covering, I suspect, all, you know, from zero to hero, so to speak, on, mm -hmm. uh, through Swarm, uh, maybe a bit of Kubernetes in there. Um, I'm a bit curious, just over the five years or so that Docker has been around and that you've been yeah. uh, spreading that knowledge, um, how, how much of the, how much of your, the focus of your training uh, changed, either the specific um, topics that you're speaking to or the types of questions that you're getting from... Um, yeah. Yeah, from people. It's, it, it's, a, it's a great question, uh, and I have noticed it's actually several things. One is a lot more management is taking this stuff now. Like, uh, it happens this week, and then it happened last week or last month in New York City when we did this same thing in Manhattan. Um, I actually had uh, a gentleman show up last month, and I, I have everybody go around the room and talk when it's a small room. If it's 200 people, I can't do that. But um, And one guy was saying... I'm like basically IT management executive, and all my people are doing Docker, and I don't know how to talk about it. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's heard, he's heard Docker 15 that's times. Right. And, yeah. and, and so that's happening. I mean, obviously that's been happening all along, but I, I feel like I'm getting a higher percentage of those people that maybe aren't the, the leading edge engineers that are actually working on it, and it's more of the business people that need to understand the benefits. Uh, super valuable, though. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I'd, I've often considered that those that are slightly separated from the technologies and the culture um, and the methodologies that are covered at a conference like Velocity, that uh, just, uh, just, just attending for a day a conference like this, the inundation that, that those individuals re will receive by yeah. talk after talk after talk of, of hearing these things would just not only dramatically benefit um, that manager or that, that individual who's slightly separated from the technology or from the, the culture, the, the methods, um, but would also super benefit the teams that are you know, tr trying to communicate with right. uh, those decision makers. Right. Um, Going back home and being able to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah having some common ground, too. It just, 
it's just uh, it's a particularly painful thing for me in some of the environments that that I engage in where um, we're just coming to a, a topic from two different worlds and uh, and do docker isn't uh, you know docker pants it, it's a container and a container <laughs> isn't uh, you know docker pants. isn't uh, Dockers versus Docker. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And by the way, the correct way to say it is Docker, not Dockers. Like, I hear people say plural, like, I have many Dockers, and that uh, I don't think that should be the correct way to say it. I've seen that a lot myself. <laughs> I, yeah. I have multiple Docker engines, not I have Dockers. Um, <laughs> well, we don't, yeah. well, we don't, we don't want to get into, you know, cube CTL and, and cube cuddle here. That's right. But, uh, that's right. I'm a cube, I'm a cube cuddle. Right, I, I right. used to be a cube CTL, yeah. but then I heard that, uh, Hightower says it. So, Just kind of, you embrace your, was... your infrastructure, sort of <laughs> hug it, love on it. Well, it's a word on the internet, so no one knows how to say it, okay. right? Like yeah, it's a yeah, made up word right. on the internet. Yeah. So we all like every other startup in Silicon Valley, it's like, what is, how do you say this how word? Do, yeah. And then it's the awkward, like, uh, Udemy where my courses are. I used to call it Udemy. I, everyone I talked to talk, calls it Udemy, and then I got on a call with people from the company, and they kept saying Udemy, and I felt really awkward. Sure, <laughs> sure. I, uh, I've been set straight by different Amazonians, different different folks at AWS, saying, um, uh, "Hey, where's your Ami?" I said, "Oh, you're what?" And then I talked to a different. And where's, oh, your, wow. where's your Amy? And uh, how about your AMI? I just, yeah, uh, I've always ac I never actually did that. I've never I've never done Ami or Amy. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yes, uh, words on the internet. All right, so we're going to get to some questions now, and thank you so much for being patient uh, if you had early questions. Uh, so uh, first up, we have uh, Raymond's asking about, hello, by the way, on the internet, uh, asking about my Kubernetes course. So I'm actually working on that course now. We're uh, getting ready to launch uh, in the next month or two the Docker for Node.js course. I'm very excited about that. Uh, working on that one because I'm I have I originally discovered Docker because I was doing Node.js in my own startup uh, five years ago, and we needed we needed more agile stuff, right? We needed to deploy faster. We needed to test faster, and so mm -hmm. it was early days for Docker. Um, but my startup failed, but my tech was awesome because <laughs> I was using Docker, <laughs> and my co-founder and I were. Um, uh, we're really enjoying Docker, and that's actually where I got the bug. But mm. um, so I've gone back to my roots a little bit, and now uh, I'm not teaching you Node.js. I'm not teaching you Docker. What I'm teaching you is if you know the basics of those new those two tools, how best to do everything Node.js in Docker, how to do the best uh, development setup, how do you CI/CD in Node.js with Docker, how do you do production Node in Docker, and uh, how do you scale with uh, Node with Docker. So that'll be a course coming out soon. You'll see that if you're signed up for my newsletter or if you're subscribed to this YouTube channel, obviously. Uh, then after that will be a Kubernetes course coming out. Um, I'm going to guess the first quarter of 2019. So that is the answer to your question there. We're going to hold, hold you to that, right? I know, so right? Uh, date, again, dates are made up dates. <laughs> 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 they can change at any time. Um, so yes, yeah, be, be sure to bug me in three months. For if, sorry, um, first quarter. First quarter uh, next year. Uh, Gakomo, I'm going to hopefully not butcher your name. Sorry about that. Uh, hello, Brett. I've had some problems in, to understand why I should use IP range and subnet since I need to specify both in CIDR format. I do not understand why I have to use both. If I use IP range, then Docker requires subnet as a mandatory field. I want to create a network with two containers. Each one will host a specific service, and they will have to talk to each other. This is, a, this is a long question. You win the award for today on the longest question. <laughs> the command I used is you give me a Docker command, and then I still do not understand why I need to specify both the options in which scenario these options can be used in a proper way. All right, I think I saw your question this morning in Slack. And so what you're asking about is specifically when creating Docker networks and making custom IP settings, why do you need to specify both subnet and IP range? And the answer there is that the subnet Instead of you set, setting a subnet mask in Docker, you're just setting the subnet, and you're giving it the, the range, the, the size of the subnet that needs that Docker needs to use in order to set the default gateway. So if you're familiar with TCP and IP technology, um, by the way, that whole thing should have been just called IP, not TCP IP. It's kind of a weird name. Anyway, uh, you would set the subnet as if it's the subnet mask, right? So let's say you have a Class C subnet, like a 192.168, um, maybe your subnet is 192.168.1.0. Okay, easy, easy to do. 
And then your IP range, maybe you only want Docker to use um, you know, 25 IPs in that subnet, and you don't want it to go beyond that. So then you would only allow it to use that range in that subnet. Um, so that's, that's the reason you might use both of those. So I think in part what you're saying is <clears throat> that is even though the Docker network create command feels a bit duplicative in terms of having to list out the, right. the subnet uh, range, the CIDR mask, that what you're saying is, hey, the, in that command, you're saying, hey, here's the here's the actual network, here's the subnet, the mask that's used the, for it. Here's how that route would be propagated and, uh, propagated and exchanged um, yeah. through other network routers, but that there may be a range within that subnet that you'd like to, you're informing Docker to either um, use or not use to, to maybe within that same network range, you're using some IPs yeah. somewhere else, you've yeah. got those reserved. Yeah, I mean, because the IP range, well, and that's one of the things is um, a Docker network may not actually be NATed. It may actually be something that is uh, like a Mac VLAN, which is using the real IPs on your real network. So you may, your, your subnet and what Docker can use are definitely going to be two different things there. Um, and the other thing is like the, uh, you're talking about Docker potentially being a sort of DHCP server or acting as one when it's creating its own NAT, so you may want to control that a little more granularly. Because it just, when a new container comes up on that network, you know, d depending upon how many network interfaces that container has, mm -hmm. Docker needs to assign it, you know, hand out one or more IP addresses so yeah. it can be, okay. Yeah, one per container, at least by default. That's the Docker networking way. Of course, if you're talking Kubernetes, it has its own networking models, um, but when you're doing Docker network create, that is, uh, yeah, that's... The, just a point on that, I think th this is a super interesting uh, thing. I think it's a, a lot of times people go to deploy um, you know, um, Docker infrastructure, or Kubernetes infrastructure, and a lot of times out of the box, there'll be a choice made for you uh, mm -hmm. based on whatever distribution you're, yeah. you're deploying. And, and it's a certain, you know, whether it's a CNI driver or, or other, that um, you may not understand which type of network you're going to be getting or which driver is included in that bundle. Yeah. Most of, you know, between Swarm and Kubernetes, you've got uh, choice there. Um, I think, you know, the default networking in, in Swarm is, is, you know, bridge mode, so you do right. have the NAT that you were talking about, which can be convenient or, or get in your way. Yeah. The, the thing you mentioned about Mac VLAN, I think it's interesting. I don't, I don't think um, uh, Mac VLAN is one of those things that's commonly talked about or that people might understand I think a lot of times overlay networking is um, super convenient um, yeah. gets gets used a lot for connecting disparate you know disparate uh, hosts it's disparate the easy system. button yeah. yeah it's the uh, shadow IT button for uh, <laughs> <laughs> the shadow networking button right the shadow the shadow Cisco engineer <laughs> but the, yeah that's right. but the Mac VLAN but the, uh, you know part of what you pay you know you, there's a cost to that convenience though mm -hmm. yep. of uh, of overlay networking you're adding a couple of additional uh, um, headers on the outside of your packet, and so you've yeah. got to add those and strip those off at, at each you know end of the tunnel, so to speak. Um, but something like Mac VLAN, sort of this this underlay networking, yeah. if you will, um, where your your container is really inside the same network namespace as your host. Um, there's a lot of efficiency. Or, you know, there's not the performance, yeah, uh, but maybe a bit of security concerns um, to the extent that. Yeah, yeah. I mean. It, I, I got excited about bridge networking originally because I realized that inherently, even if you just did bridge networking, you were already going to be probably more secure in a data center than a lot of people are, right? I mean, obviously, if you're a sophisticated shop and you have dedicated networking teams and they're making all the proper security groups and VLANs and all that stuff, depending on whether you're in the cloud or in the data center. But I and I've grown up operating in large data centers and even you know small shops that only have a couple of racks in a closet. And I know that those groups tend to leave the, everything wide open, and it's, and that's sort. And then, the challenge with increasing security in that situation is when you have existing infrastructure, and then you want to lock the networking down. It gets really hard to firewall that off, right? Because you've got a bunch of undocumented ports. And so, when I saw Docker originally, and I saw the bridge networking model, I thought, wow. Assuming that we can make everything work in this way, this is going to mean my apps are naturally firewalled by default, and I have to explicitly open, right? That expose or that published port meant that we had to explicitly document, essentially, in our DevOps tooling, every port that's necessary, which, coming from a Windows background, I know that like there's a crap ton of ports 
and Windows, and they're all being used all over the place, and no one's documenting them, right? Yeah. It's, it's only when you go to like the DMZ do you end up documenting usually every port that every server needs. So, so yeah, there's pros and cons, right? So kind of in part, with one of the things you're saying is uh, while having to deal with NAT can be a little bit of additional overhead, some cognizant uh, overhead as well, just in terms yeah. of you know, trying to, there's some inherent security benefit to um, having those having those containers, in this case, yeah. behind that. Yeah, unless you've got uh, a networking team that, like, you know, Cisco, other companies, they all have networking drivers now for containers. And uh, if you have that level, like, if you have a consolidated environment in a data center where you're using the hyperconverged stuff where it's all in one big rack, you're probably a lot better off uh, just from a networking perspective because it's already software-based and it's uh, everyone has to design it. But a lot of shops are still... You know, they're deploying containers into legacy infrastructure where everything's open by default. So I, I love the idea that, you know, uh, you basically publish three ports in that app maybe, and they're all just web services or websites, and, and the back end isn't completely open. And um, But, yeah, there's a cost to that in performance. There's a cost to that in, in the number of hops. So then you have to worry about TCP connections and stateless versus stateful. Yeah, so it doesn't make it – it's not always the easy button, and I think the devil's in the details sometimes. But, yeah, so great question. Um, uh, hopefully that answers your question. Steven's up next. Uh, Steven said, oh, by the way, hello, Steven. Um, are you planning, can you recommend a great reading resource for Docker and CI CD? So I don't actually have a CI CD course I'd recommend. Um, there's actually uh, a Docker captain that works uh, for CloudBees, which is the company that makes Jenkins. There's actually two Docker captains, no, three Docker captains now. Three Docker captains because they acquired um, Linda's uh, co company um, or Laura's company. Sorry, uh, Codeship. Codeship, yeah. yeah. And uh, CloudBees does Jenkins and Codeship, so those are both CI/CD tools. So I would look around for those captains. In fact, um, uh, you can probably go. In case you didn't know, you can go to Docker's website and go to slash captains. And there's a list of them there. And so then, uh, oh, so maybe if I did, let's see if I can do this, cloud. <laughs> okay, so only Victor shows up. Well, there's actually three captains that are working for CloudBees, but uh, evidently Victor's the only one that put it in his, in his title. Um, so uh, Victor was actually the one I was going to mention to you because he has a couple of books on CI, CD, and sort of devops -y stuff. You can actually find it on technologyconversations.com. So I'm going to throw that in there for you. Um, he's got a couple of books, and what I, what I love about his site is he actually, uh, because of his books, he created his own community, and he has a bunch of repos on uh, GitHub for all these little tools to help you get containers into production, especially for like solo DevOps or small team DevOps where you need simple tools that don't have yeah. every bell and whistle in them. Um, I think they're over at um, Proxy. It's, I think his website's called dockerflow.com, actually. And he has a bunch of open source projects that they may not solve all your CI, CI issues specifically because you're going to need to pick a, a continuous integration solution uh, for your testing and for making your Docker containers. And all of them work with containers nowadays. I don't think anyone's avoiding the container uh, revolution. So whatever one you use today is probably going to work fine with Docker. Um, but what he does have is he has some tools there. And then, of course, he has books on his website. I think he has three now like his, um, of DevOps books. Yeah, what, you have books. Uh, yeah, a couple. I guess the, the most recent one that was released was uh, an O'Reilly book, um, The Enterprise path to service mesh architectures. All right, uh, let's look that up. Oh, not there. Which, uh, which is actually uh, you know, kind of nice for a good introduction to service meshes, a bit of comparison between different service mesh projects that are out there. Let's see if Google is your friend. And maybe even more importantly, um, is this you? Uh, Ginger Geek, I've, got, I've just figured I would embrace the uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. The, the love freckles, it. the red hair. The, yeah. Um, All right. This is this is your book, or one. Uh, of, do you have more than one book? Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's uh, well, there's a couple in the works right now. Actually, I'm an Istio up and running. Nice. Uh, a bit of uh, potentially a service meshes cookbook uh, after that. 
Um, and you, publish, uh, and you publish all these on O'Reilly, or and you... those are all uh, through O'Reilly. There's nice. uh, potentially um, a video course coming through Pact Publishing. Ooh, uh, teaser! So yeah, hey, yeah, hey. <laughs> uh, service mesh again. So you're seeing a pattern there. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, uh, obviously we d d distracted you for a little bit. Uh, so your books aren't specifically on CI, but I just wanted to admit I knew that he was an author, and I wanted to talk about his books. Um, so service mesh. So I remember you talked to me about Prometheus uh, like a, six months, eight months ago. Do you see? Um, I, I, did you hop maybe from monitoring into service mesh? Is, do you see those uh, as related? Yeah, they, uh, they certainly are. What's interesting is on the surface, um, you wouldn't necessarily naturally see that connection. Um, but one of the bigger reasons why people come to a service mesh is for observability is for um, uniform observability, actually. Um, and that's the notion that, yeah, if, you're, if you've got your application, if you've got your workloads, your containers, your applications running on a service mesh, that um, one of the more prominent pieces of value is a bit of, um, uh, or not a bit of, a lot of telemetry, that a lot of, um, oh, yeah. I, I hesitate to say, there's a, I wouldn't say, you know, there's some amount of auto instrumentation, not necessarily inside the containers themselves, not yeah. in your app, but for all of the communication happening between each of your services, um, logs and metrics and a bit of um, uh, the facilitation of distributed tracing, a bit of uh, auto-generated spans that are, that are created for any of the requests that go that come external, go onto the mesh, and then flow across different containers within your mesh. Right, right. Um, uh, lots and lots of telemetry generated from that. And so while service meshes and, and different meshes provide different um, features and features, stuff like that, yeah. But, um, but that observability, that uh, kind of back to that Prometheus and that monitoring, um, yeah, one of the more, more it, well, not the one, it, it's the biggest reason that I've found that people come to use um, a service mesh is to gain visibility into what, you know, what the heck is happening. Um, right. You know, and it, again, I'll, I'll maybe differentiate between kind of the, the in, inside the container, kind of the white box monitoring, the APM that you might have for right. your app. Um, that's, a, that's a bit of a separate um, concern, not a concern that um, service meshes get to, but rather, I don't know that you would say, you would characterize this as black box, but I would just uh, um, not oversell what um, service meshes provide today by saying that they do that inside the app uh, monitoring. Right. But they sure, but they give you a ton of visibility around service level metrics. Um, which, which is probably the, the top level things that you're going to want to be uh, monitoring day in and day out. Those are the, the probably the biggest indicators of whether or not um, you're having trouble inside your app. Is are, are you? How, how are those? What's the overall latency um, for your requests? Yeah. Um, the, the, anyway, the, the, yeah. the observability from there. I, I'm going to stop. I won't, I won't talk about the rest of the features of Service Mesh, but. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that, that's the, the the relationship, kind of the pull yeah. between Prometheus and yeah, and both are like super hot topics right now, right? Everybody's talking about monitoring, especially open source tooling monitoring. Um, I saw in the keynote this morning that uh, mentioned Datadog, which I'm also a fan of. It's definitely not the cheapest solution out there, but uh, I think you in a lot of ways you get what you pay for. And uh, they they I use their product pretty early on before they even did logging um, for a a pretty big online video CDN solution. And it was, we were increasingly making more dynamic workloads. And the one of the challenges with monitoring old school was it wasn't designed for dynamic infrastructure usually. And Doc, uh, Datadog was like the first one I used that was really designed, for, even it was this, this was actually pre-container. It was designed for things going up and down all the time and leaving leaving and coming back and, and that it was able to look at a much larger picture way easier than a typical tool would. The ephemerality of containers and functions, um, yeah, have flipped uh, monitoring tooling on their head, so to speak, <laughs> or something. Yeah, some the, time ago. the old agent model yeah. where you had to you manually installed an agent and you created custom names for everything. It's got to be done. Yeah, you know, this was service discovery back to your earlier point, just yeah. super kind of key to how a lot of this works, keeping track of things. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, during the workshop that I held yesterday on uh, Istio, uh, we, we reviewed um, an adapter that, that we'd written at SolarWinds that interfaces with, uh, speaking of logging, with, with PaperTrail, with Logly, 
and also with, with App Optics, which is all three of which are SolarWinds products that um, provide uh, monitoring, yeah. uh, you know, assuming that your infrastructure is observable or your, your apps are observable. And so, yeah, the, the, I think you're, you're hitting it on the head with, with respect to uh, the new tooling that people need as they go to, you know, work with containers. Work yeah, with. it has to uh, change. Yeah, and, and a lot of tools, especially that uh, are designed around uh, things being around for a long time. Because <laughs> yeah. that's not true in uh, in container well, land for sure. You can, you can still go call it cube cuddle and, and hug your infrastructure if you want to, but it's <laughs> it's not a pet, Brent. Right, it's not a... <laughs> right. I can treat it like a pet, but it still is not a pet. Um, so, all right, a couple more questions. Uh, hopefully, we can fit all these in. Um, Viraj, I uh, hope I'm saying your name correctly. Uh, hello, Brett. I want to access code that is residing in Docker. I want to access code that is residing in Docker to my IntelliJ IDA. Um, IDE maybe, or, or is that uh, a product for development code changes? Is it good to do from Docker file or using any other Linux way? I'm new to Docker. Um, so you're looking to access code that is residing in Docker. All right, so if you're taking my Docker mastery course, not to do another plug, but uh, I explain in that course uh, how that you, you're going to have your code on your host and you're going to bind mount it into the container at runtime just for local development. So you don't want to run an image and then somehow edit stuff in the container. What you want to do is you want to create that bind mount connection, which is kind of like a sim link or a share of your code from your host machine. So definitely uh, you can probably find some basic tutorials. I recommend you check out Docker Compose, which again is in my Docker mastery course. Um, you can get that over on this URL that I mentioned earlier, uh, brettfisher.com slash docker. There's coupons for that there. And actually, a lot of those videos, if you scroll down the page, a lot of those videos are free on YouTube um, through Udemy. So you can get a lot of that stuff uh, without having to pay for the course. But if you want the full, uh, sort of the full complete picture of 101 development for an a engineer, definitely check out my course. That'll explain how you get your code connected to your host machine. Um, hopefully that answers your question. If not, uh, please ask another one. That's, uh, that's nice. It sounds like the, what you're saying is you don't have to go through that process of rebuilding your container yeah. just to see the changes in your code. Yeah. In fact, I, I think my like day one for me with Docker, I was doing that. I was like, this can't be the right thing to do because this seems really painful. <laughs> I, yeah. Uh, yeah. Every time I save a file, rebuild your image was not um, <laughs> not a workflow I wanted to adopt. So. Uh, so Pan, hi, I already completed your Docker mastery course. Thank you. Um, it was good and with clear concept examples. It would help us more in our professional stuff if you include more complex real-time examples or scenarios. Thanks for the feedback. Of course, that is a living, breathing course that will continue to grow uh, as I add more stuff. So yes, expect um, over time that there'll be more examples in there. I'm also, you know, obviously more courses are planned, so there'll be more stuff there, but thanks for that. Um, I'm always looking for more examples. So you can also look at my GitHub repo for some example uh, stuff as well. <coughs> Beth, can I get some water? Um, who do we have next? <coughs> you can take the next one. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very good. So, uh, if, I, if I was tracking correctly, uh, so we just covered uh, SOPAN, so we've got uh, uh, Giacomo, uh, Pagiano, great. So stash subnet, kind of referring back to our, our the previous question about uh, the Docker network create command and its inclusion of a couple of subnets. And um, the question here is, so, you know, so great, um, dash dash subnet is more used to specify routes so Docker containers can reach from other endpoints outside the range I set in Docker, right? Yeah, that sounds right. Um, yep, very good. Yeah, we... Easy question. <clears throat> oh my goodness, I'm losing my voice. <coughs> After the two days of talking, it's right there. So okay. I had this magic spray um, called Entertainer's Secret. It doesn't really uh, do... It's it. Not, yeah, it's not. It turns out it's a bit more magic than it is uh, useful. <laughs> I, uh, there's only t two days of training, Brett, and... and uh, Woo! Yeah. That'll, that'll do it. Right. Knock your voice out. Uh, All right, you take the next one. Uh, Jorge says, uh, welcome to London. Yes, uh, it's good to be here. 
I'm still work, we, we're on the same small island, so it's funny that we you know meet up at the same uh, same <laughs> conference. That's but, right. Um, We've met before in real life. Yeah. Jorge says uh, I got started with Docker some months ago. My app is working now with Docker Compose, uh, and I want to prepare it for production. So you know, should oh. I go to Swarm or, or Kubernetes? And then Brett, I think you called it. This question was coming. It's a uh, great question, Jorge. How would you answer that? Uh, well, with the uh, Boy, I've given uh, more talks on container orchestration than I should have in the past. <laughs> and uh, the net of it was that sort of unfortunate, it depends. I think my general guidance without asking any questions of the team that you're in, the capabilities and knowledge that you have, the complexity of the requirements of your, um, your app, like because those are sort of all of the it depends part of the answer, are that my, my general guidance um, uh, to folks is that it is a natural evolution uh, to, and is that you, you will be the, the most successful, the most quickly by, uh, and it's right there at your fingertips, by enabling Swarm. And, uh, and it has a, a fair bit of power to it. It has a number of new constructs for you to learn and understand, get familiar with some distributed systems, some you know, Docker services um, as, a, as a concept, as one of those mm -hmm. new constructs. And it may well turn out that, um, depending upon your app and your requirements, that um, that fulfills your needs, and, yeah. and you kind of you stop there. And, and uh, <clears throat> from my perspective, the if it didn't, then you would move on to more complex, uh, a little more powerful things like uh, like Kubernetes. That um, that your experience with Swarm would enable you to be successful with something like Kubernetes. And so that's just sort of general counsel that I've yeah. I like it. Out, so. I like that. I, I think that's good stuff. Um, oh, we can switch back. And, uh, Boom, I, back in London. <laughs> with the magic <laughs> of the internet. <laughs> um, I love a container orchestrator question. I, oh, Gavin's in here. Hi, Gavin, uh, uh, one of my uh, regulars. Um, OK, yeah, he's, he's commenting on uh, Swarm and Kubernetes. Yeah. Biker is in here from the course. Hello, Biker. I have a problem. Oh. You have your left round table. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, let's see. What's his question? I have a huge problem. <clears throat> I'm not going to read this one because it's long. <laughs> huh. Very good. Uh, Biker, I think that that's, um, so your question is, sounds like it's around, uh, it sounds like a problem in your app, or maybe something, a uh, problem with the servers. Whenever I have funky networking or spe speed, and I know my app is fine, and it works fine in test, honestly, I kill the server. I replace mm -hmm. the server. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what orchestration's hoping to achieve for us, right, is destroy the node that acts funny, see if it's, replace the node, see if it fixes the problem. So it's kind of nice. It is a, sort of a benefit of, of a bit of this immutable infrastructure stuff. Is maybe you know the approach to troubleshooting becomes a little bit easier to the extent that you can just you know blow it away. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, try it again, <clears throat> or force the container to work on a different node. See if that's the problem. Um, it's probably something related to your app, even though it because I mean I I don't the whole it runs fast the first time. Um, it's still fast. Uh, yeah, that's that all st kind of sounds stuff like a uh, app related caching. Maybe a memory leak or a yeah. Runs. So I'm not blaming your code or anything like that. Uh, just I don't have an obvious answer for how to troubleshoot that right off the the, the bat. So sorry, just throw uh, throw me some Slack chats later and we can uh, talk about it more more offline. Um, Arun, uh, hello Brett. I have a case where a client wants to migrate a large number of similar apps to Docker in a lift and shift mode. Any suggestion on tools for automating this? I don't have any. Yeah, I know. I remember a uh, DockerCon or two ago where there was uh, some tooling mentioned around, um, you know, containerizing oh, yeah. kind of existing apps. And and I thought, you know, container, containerizing your existing app, kind of lifting and shifting it into a container. And, and I thought that that, two things. One, what a fantastic tool um, and that can be. Mm -hmm. Two, 
much like kind of a, a WYSIWYG, uh, much like other code generation utilities, yeah. that that might be a really fat container, or or yeah. it might be that the application that it's trying to lift and ship, that it's trying to containerize for you, uh, maybe maybe it doesn't do. I think you you get what you maybe you pay for that convenience. Yeah, uh, I would suspect. Yeah, it needs cleanup afterwards usually. I'm trying to remember what the, what's the name of that tool. It Docker made them. Right. Yep, that's right. Um, they made one for Windows and Linux. All right. Uh, if you can find me on Twitter or via email or somewhere else, I will, or in Slack, if you're taking my courses, we'll see if we can't get back to you on the answer to that. There is a tool specifically, um, Arun, if uh, it's from Docker, and it's something like, it's not boot to Docker because that's a totally different thing, but it's something... And, in a GitHub repo, it's almost something on their website that I could look up really quick. But um, yeah, there are tools like, there are a few tools like that, nothing that's going to do it automatically for everything magically without work, right? Um, there just might be some things uh, to make it faster. I don't know, I don't think it's convert. Is, is it migrate? Um, no. I'll look here. Yeah. Yeah, so if you can find me somewhere else on the internet, on Twitter, ping me there, or in Slack, if you're in the Docker Mastery Slack, and I will see if we can't get you a, a, a couple of the tools you can check out. Um, is it image to Docker? Is that Gavin saying oh, image to Docker? That sounds about right. Yes. Yes, thank you so much. Glad to have you on the call, Gavin. So I'm gonna throw this in there. That's a link to Docker's, uh, they have one for Windows and Linux. Uh, so thanks, Gavin. Uh, so we'll do one, one or two more questions. Um, uh, Biker's back. Okay, yeah, giving you some more information. Yeah, again, Biker, uh, ask me offline. Uh, for those complicated troubleshooting uh, situations, it's easier for us to do it offline than uh, talk about it here. Uh, we have another Docker captain on the channel. Uh, Sune, what's up? Um, or is it soon? I'm maybe I'm okay. pronouncing your name. Sorry about that. Soon. Docker. It's definitely a hashtag Docker captains with a plural. Is it? Yeah, so. today. <laughs> we got three of them. So, uh, so Lee, I don't think we talked about, so tell everybody like who you are, what you work, oh, what sure. you do for work, how do you, how do you run your life? Yeah, you it's know, a bit of, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think the, the short of it is uh, there's an inner geek in there and it seems to have an unrelenting appetite. And so as I go to uh, feed that inner geek uh, with tech, um, but that, that leads me to spend a fair bit of time with um, the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So been um, heavily involved there for some time, um, both as kind of a, a TOC contributor, um, a, a Cloud Native ambassador, um, helping inside of the networking working group that I mentioned earlier, uh, been, uh, well, assisting or, or just causing trouble within the serverless working group there. Um, uh, so spend spend a fair bit of time there, and also with a lot of the projects that are within that are now governed within the CNCF. Nice. Uh, both kind of employing them um, in my full time role uh, at SolarWinds, um, but also uh, but also just in open source land as well um, in, in terms of uh, trying to help um, with some of those. So uh, Docker captain. So uh, you clearly spend lots of. Actually, you were talking about where you got the container bug yeah. uh, bite. Your first uh, kind of bit. <clears throat> Mine was when I was at uh, Cisco. Um, had a took a faction of my team to do uh, innovation projects. Uh, first time I met Jerome Patazzoni, um, mm -hmm. uh, asked him to come into to Cisco to do a presentation. This was about five years ago now. Um, it was the highest attended internal training that um, we had held. Uh, and not just my group, but I mean at, at Cisco. So it was, uh, I got super excited. We went off and did a number of uh, innovation projects. Uh, one of those was kind of a Cisco container hub, kind of the pre-Docker uh, trusted registry, just um, internal to Cisco. And so nice. anyway, the, the, the short of it is yeah, I end up um, you know, engaging with um, the, the new stack, if, if folks are familiar with, yeah. with that uh, uh, publication venue. Uh, with O'Reilly, a fair big fans bit. of the new stack. They're, yeah, it's a great team. Yeah. Nice folks. Um, and um, uh, that's the short. Well, and then uh, advise a couple of uh, startups. And so, um, cool. Uh, just yeah, may, generally making a nuisance of myself. I think, nice. Uh, wherever. And you live in Texas, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So uh, a couple of Americans here in London. 
have no idea what we're doing here. <laughs> uh, go into a pub maybe uh, later, trying to figure out how to have a proper pint. Um, so I exercise my um, my Texas um, drawl whenever I can, and it's particularly around you know container orchestra writers and when I talk about those. But that's about as that's about as that's great. far as that's it great. goes. Do you so. start your workshop like that, and everyone thinks is he going to talk like that the whole time? <laughs> <laughs> Who is this guy? <laughs> right, walking in your cowboy got, boots, uh, your ten gallon hat. Yeah. Yesterday, I had a pop quiz uh, for the audience. I said, you know what? Uh, you know, can anyone tell me what um, istio, the word, means? And um, uh, individual in the audience chimed up. He said, Yeah, it's a, it's a sale. It's, and I said, Yeah, that's right. It's the Greek word for sale. And he said, No, no, no. It's the uh, Greek. Gr- uh, he was he was Greek himself, and, oh, okay. and uh, I got a proper instruction oh. on. Uh, yeah, so so what was it? Was it was it still a sale? Uh, it is. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah, the meaning is sale, but the way in which you, you enunciate oh. uh, in Greek the the word not what we're saying. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't come with a twang either. So oh it's not. yeah, that's tough. That's <laughs> tough. You gotta put your Greek accent on to say a word. That's tough. Um, well, at least you got that that education. So we're going to wrap this up because we've uh, we've now got an, another uh, event to go to here at O'Reilly Velocity Conference. And so thank you so much for watching. Um, and thanks for asking questions. We'll be here again next week, probably the same day. I will schedule it on YouTube so you can see and get reminders that way. Thank you so much, Lee, for showing up. Where can people find you on the internet? Uh, it's gingergeek.com. That's probably gingergeek.com. Yeah. What, uh, on Twitter? Uh, Twitter, it's uh, L C A L C O T E. It's a uh, L Calcote on right. Twitter. Yeah. Uh, great. Uh, and we will see you next time on the internet. Thanks. Bye, y'all.